is Psalms 9 and 17, and then we're going to go to Daniel chapter 12. Some things that we need to teach our, our kids early on is that there is a God, that He is holy, He is just, He is righteous. That good is rewarded, there's a heaven to gain, but there is also a hell to shun. Not only is God real, but Satan is real. The devil is real. The old Irish uh, miner Billy Brave said that, that he knows God is real because he's done business with him. And most of us here has done business. We know the devil is real because he's done business with him. Most of us have done business with the devil over the years. He's a great deceiver. He's a liar, a deceiver, a disruptor. But God is good, and, and God wants to be in your corner tonight. He wants to save you. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And uh, I've noticed in my lifetime there uh, has been a, a tendency to downplay sin through the years in the the churches, and you get the, the liberal points of view that try to uh, somewhat will say, well, there isn't really a hell. How, why would God send people to hell? And I guess that's a fair question, but the point is God don't send anyone to hell. Sin is what sends people to hell, and then ultimately because of sin, death is required. So uh, God made a way for you to escape the, the uh, this awful place of hell and he offers eternal life and then what ultimately sends anyone and everyone to hell is rejection of Jesus Christ that free gift but I think it's Billy Graham at one, one time made a comment that, uh, that death was separation from God but it's certainly much more than that he received a lot of uh, criticism for that and I love Billy Graham and I think he repented of that statement, or I understood that he did. But in Psalms 9, 17, let's see what the Bible says about this place called hell. It's real. And it's something you need to know about. The, the fear of hell was a great uh, motivator for me to trust Jesus Christ and get saved because I knew I was a rascal. I knew I had it coming to me. If, if I had to pay for my own sins, I had a problem. But Psalms 9, 17, the Bible says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. And I'm going to read some uh, scriptures here just to talk about uh, this, this awful place called hell. In Daniel 12, 2, it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In Matthew 25, 46, it says, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, uh, let me qualify that by the fact that they, the only uh, way that we get righteousness is not by living righteous, but by trusting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So somebody had to die for us to have righteousness. To vindicate our sin, there needs to be some uh, death of someone. I can pay with my death. You can pay with your death. But God says, why don't you trust in the death of my precious son, Jesus Christ? So his death is the paid the wages of our sin. All we have to do is reach out by simple faith and trust him. And I remember uh, the time dealing with... with uh, my old friend Don over at Sunman, and he, he, he was a skeptic most of his life. He wasn't sure. He wasn't sure about God. And, and so I said, uh, Don, he said, I'm not sure that I have enough faith to get saved. And he was facing death. He had cancer. He said, I want to I wanna believe it enough to get to, I, I, you know. I, I said, are you willing to step out on the measure of faith that God gives you? And sometimes it comes to that. You, I mean, uh, you want to believe in God, what, what the disciples say, Lord, help my unbelief. Sometimes it's a matter of saying, God, I'm not sure of anything, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to step out by faith, believing 
that you'll save me if I do that and asking that you do. And uh, it's, the Lord said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. Well, a child, when a child gets saved, they don't understand it all. They're just, it's just an act of, of, of faith. There's a lot they don't understand. As a mature Christian, there's going to be so much about this book. You're going to understand less about this book than you know about this book. The, the, the truth of the ages is found in this book if, we, if it was open to us. One day the Lord's going to open that scripture and we'll understand it. The song says, we'll understand it all. By and by. In Revelation 20, 15, it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's scary business. As a, a young man, about 12 and 13 years old, man, I, I looked at that and I said, Boy, I don't want to go there. Yeah, I was, I was afraid of hell. It was a healthy fear. I fear that many today do not teach their children this healthy fear. Uh, there's a few verses that teach there's a hell. Jesus uh, taught there is a hell in Luke 16. He describes it as a literal place. In Mark 9, 43, if you want to go there with me. Mark 9 and verse 43, it, it says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than to have two hands to go into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He said, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into a halt into life than to have having two feet to be cast into hell. Into the fire, watch here it is again, that never shall be quenched. Verse 46, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Then in verse 47 it says, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes that be cast into hell fire. It says, it says again, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now I look at that, the passage, note that that's in Mark. That's before the body of Christ was formed. And, and if you understand the new birth, that, that soul and spirit is cut loose from the body of flesh. But prior to that, when Old Testament, someone died, the flesh is stuck to the soul. My, my flesh cleaveth to the dust. My soul cleaveth to the dust. So that would give a little understanding to that. Now, the new birth, that, that flesh is cut loose, but... Uh, you know, human logic even tells us there's a, a hell. Human laws demand that justice be met on uh, wrongdoers. A punishment is uh, given out. Uh, and uh, you would think that God, God gives rewards uh, for service and there's punishment for sin. God is good and God loves all men, but his love does not cover the sinner from the justice of a righteous holy God. But his mercy does. All we have to do is reach out and accept it. There's no excuse for not trusting Jesus Christ. Uh, if you don't trust him, you, most folks just don't want to trust him. They, they want to wallow in their sin and think everything's going to be all right. But there's always a, a come up, of this, so to speak. I've dealt with people who've been involved in and, 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 and addictions and things in their past come up to bite them. Even after they've gotten clean, things can come up and bite you. And uh, God has to, uh, to meet justice because he's holy. It has to be just. I quoted the verse, John three sixteen For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever... Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the, that the world through him might be saved. He don't want you to go to hell. If you go to hell, it's not God's fault. He made a way. 
The Bible says in verse 18 there that he that believeth on him is not condemned. That he, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, watch it, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. God gives a sinner every chance. Every chance. He loves then. He, he sent his uh, son to atone, uh, to restore that person, constantly pleads with sinners to repent. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us. In the while we were yet sinners. A lot of people have the misconception, and I think a lot of uh, uh, churches promote this, that you've got to clean up your act before you can get saved. Well, you got to turn over a new leaf. You turn over a new leaf, then maybe you can get saved. No, it don't work that way. God accepts you for salvation just exactly like you are. My, my. Uh, if a man is uh, damned eternally to hell, it's not, it's not God's fault. Uh, and uh, where is hell? I've, I've got some notes here on where it is. Well, I'm going to look at Isaiah 14. It's, according to Scripture, it's, it's down. Heaven is up. Hell is down. Isaiah 14, 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Psalms 55, 15. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Uh, if you're writing these verses down, Ezekiel 32, 27. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised which are gone down to hell with the weapons of war and they have laid their swords under their heads but their iniquities shall be upon their bones though they were in terror of the mighty in the land of the living. It's uh, referred to in Amos as a place to dig to. Amos 9 2, though they dig into hell then shall mine hand take them Though they climb up to heaven, there's a difference. <laughs> That's why I bring them down. It's called deep in Job 11, 8. Uh, Job 11, 8, the Bible says, It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? It's all called, so referred to as being low in Psalms 86, 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Uh, it's referred to as being beneath in Proverbs 15, 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. So that's uh, so much scripture on, on the, the location it's also referred to, there's a word nether. And I, th I think the meaning of that word is lowest. And you'll find that in Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel 31, 16, I made the nation to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit, always going down, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted and the nether parts of the earth. They also went down in verse 17. They also went down into hell with them and to them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under the shadow of the midst of the heathen. It's also referred to as the heart of the earth. Now most of you have learned from science class that the heart of the earth is, is molten hot of the extreme heat the heart of the earth Matthew 12 40 says for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth so hell is in the heart of the earth we see from the, uh, the story of the rich man in hell that he's in, he's in paradise and there's a gulf between him and hell 
where the, uh, or, or Lazarus is in paradise, but the rich man's in hell, and there's a gulf between him and Lazarus. He said, please send La- Abraham, please send Lazarus that he might take his finger and dip it in water and cool my tongue. So we, we, we know they're, they're both in, in the center of the earth when the Lord died. It says, as the Lord was, as he died on the cross, Three days and three nights went down to the heart of the earth. He deposited our sins in hell. And we know when he came back, he told Mary not to touch him for he had not ascended to his father. He didn't have them, our sins with him then. Cast them to hell and he emptied out paradise. How do we know he went to paradise? He told the rich man, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Or told, not the rich man, I'm getting my context wrong here. Told that thief on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. It's a place of lost souls. Wait, let me back up. I had another verse here. Ephesians 4, 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? All right. Uh, It's a place for lost souls. Hell is. It says in Luke 16, 19, there was a certain rich man. Here's the story. Which was, was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And it goes on to talk about the beggar dying and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which was paradise. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell. He lift up his eyes, being in torments. So it's a place of torment. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. For those that deny the flames of hell, they're denying the word of God because it clearly states it. Uh, what a story. Uh, it's a place of demonic creatures. <laughs> Revelation 9, 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. In verse 7 it says, And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared in a battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. These came out of the the pit, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Tails like in the scorpions. All these things associated with a bottomless pit. And the thorn shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles, it says in Isaiah 34. In the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an inhabitation of dragons and a court for owls. Man, what a spooky, occult-sounding, awful place it is. It says, a wild beast of the desert shall also meet with a wild beast of the island and the satyr. Uh, shall cry to his uh, fellow, the screech owl, also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. It's a, it's a place, the Bible says, of flesh-eating birds, Isaiah 34, 11, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, and the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, for he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island and the satyr shall cry unto his fellow, my, my, my. Said, there shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under the shadow. There shall be vultures also gathered, everyone with her mate. Man, it's spooky. It's a spooky place. I'm going to read something here <coughs> that, that I copied several years ago. It says, Stray, strange marine creatures have been discovered living in dark, deep-sea waters 
heated by volcanic vents in the Gulf of California, according to a joint U.S.-Mexican expedition. I don't know, don't remember the data, don't have it dated here. Peter Lonsdale, a Scripps Institution of Oceanography geologist who heads the, the scientific team, returned Monday from the expedition in the Guiamas Basin, about 600 miles southeast of San Diego. Two similar finds have been made in the open sea. This was the first in the semi-enclosed basin and the discoveries of red snake-like worms that live <laughs> where the worm dieth not. Remember that? In long white tubes in the mild deep waters raise a question about the necessity of sunlight to support life. The worms were found near undersea geysers and 60 foot high sulfide cones that warmed the water. Scientists took pictures of the worms and other creatures similar to those found in 1976 in two C4 vents off Ecuador and Mexico. It says all three geysers are located along spreading center cracks in the Earth's crust. These centers are where lava is pushing up to the ocean floor as giant plates of the Earth's crust fall, uh, pull apart, Londale said. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be part of that, that darkness and that weirdness and the torment. Especially since I don't have to. It's a, a place of consciousness. It's a, not a place for souls just to exist as if they're asleep. Separated from God. No, it's, it's more than that. Notice uh, uh, the rich man. The story of the rich man. He could see. He lifted up his eyes. He could speak. He cried out to Abraham. He could hear. He expected an answer back from Abraham. He could feel. He sought water to be placed on his tongue, on his lips. Certainly, uh, then he could smell if all the other senses were present. Senses were present. He could reason. He sought compassion for his five brothers. You remember that? Because he found out that hell is a, a losing proposition. It's no place I want to go to. Uh, he found that hell uh, was a place to live without God for the pleasures of this world, its riches. You don't have the, the big party. If I heard friends of mine say, yeah, I'm going to hell and I'm party with all my drinking buddies. No, you won't. Don't work that way. The party's over. As uh, Willie Nelson would sing, turn out the lights, the party's over. It's not a party time. That rich man, he could remember the memory. You'll have a memory, the sinners in Zion. It says, uh, are afraid fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burning? There for eternity. Memories, just having the memory of a misspent life and of the opportunities that we had in this life to trust Jesus Christ that we turned down. We turned down those offers of forgiveness and atonement. And of course, it's a place of suffering, punishment. Uh, Matthew 25, 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. It's everlasting fire. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall uh, he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. See, God never, God never prepared hell for you and for me. He made hell for the devil and his angels. The only way you got there is by rejection of Jesus Christ. It's a place of... Uh, everlasting fire, according to uh, Isaiah 33, 14. The sinners in Zion, I, I quoted that verse, are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with, ever devouring, with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning? That, man, that, if that don't scare you, there's nothing that scares you. It's a furnace of fire, according to Matthew 30, 13, 42. 
and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I heard a story one time, a preacher was preaching on hell, and he went to that verse where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and a woman came up to him after the service and said, well, preacher, what about if you don't have no teeth? He said, madam, teeth will be provided. And it's just, all right. Nobody's in the mood to laugh after this message. All right. Matthew 13, 50, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 20, 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a place, the Bible says, of fire and brimstone. Revelation 14, 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Unquenchable fire, Matthew 3, 12, whose fan is in his hand. He will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with the unquenchable fire. Isaiah 33, 14, it's referred to as a devouring fire. The sinners of Zion are afraid, and we, I already read that verse, a devouring fire. I'm going to read this article from 1978, and, and of course, Bible believers, believers, we take a grain, with a grain of salt, you'll hear these near-death experiences and so forth, and, you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, if I can't prove it by Scripture, it's, but it's interesting. <coughs> this was a newspaper article that appeared April 25th, 1978. It says a real hell exists complete with a lake of burning fire and brimstone according to a leading heart specialist. Dr. Maurice Rawlings told the Star this week that a number of clinically dead patients he had revived told him of experiencing a terrifying plunge into a flame-swept tunnel and being confronted by suffering, tormented humans. Others told him of a heavenly experience in which they were greeted by their parents in a bright light. I, you know, he said, I used to think religion was all a bunch of hocus pocus, but these patients have convinced me that there is both a heaven and a hell, Dr. Rawlings said. Dr. Rawlings, 59, of Chattanooga, Tennessee, is a fellow in the American College of Cardiology and a specialist in cardiovascular diseases. He said he has resuscitated dozens of patients who have experienced clinical death and reported that about half of them reported visions of a biblical hell while the rest said they experienced an ascent to heaven. Dr. Rawling described one harrowing episode after a patient collapsed in his office. His heart stopped and I immediately began resuscitation. It took me maybe 30 seconds to bring him around and during that time he was clinically dead. When he came to, he started screaming at me, please get me out of hell. Once I felt he was out of immediate danger, I asked him to describe what he had seen. He said he had a spinning sensation downward like he was moving through a dark tunnel. At the end of the tunnel, he saw terrible, grotesque creatures, a burning lake in a crowded cave full of suffering people. Dr. Rawling uh, said patients he had re revived reported similar experiences that one thing which struck me as too much of a coincidence, he said, the patients who described hell all said just about the same thing with only a few variations. Other patients reported heavenly experiences. They would describe moving up a mountain path or through a green meadow toward a beautiful light. A subject to hell is not a pleasant or popular subject. It's much easier to preach about heaven and the wonderful things that God had prepared for them that love him. Mike Stroh, the Jew who is now a Jewish who is now a, a Baptist preacher, he's Jewish. He was studying to be a rabbi, a Hasidic Jew, when he got saved. And when he tells about his salvation experience, he worked at a factory with a fellow uh, who was a Nazarene preacher. 
And the preacher had to stop by on the way home from work one evening to visit a fellow in the hospital. He needed a witness to him. And, and uh, he went with the preacher to the hospital, and, and, and the, the preacher uh, went to witness to this fellow, and the fellow didn't want anything to do with him. The fellow was dying. He didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ or his religion. And Brother Stroh said, uh, my, my preacher buddy went into the other room to visit someone else, and I'm sitting there and said, I saw this fellow die in front of me. He started screaming and yelling and talking about the torments of hell. And said, I got so scared, I went to my Bible and I got saved. I trusted Jesus Christ. It said, I literally saw that man go to hell before my eyes after rejecting Jesus Christ. Hell is a sad story. And you should, your heart should go out to lost people. You should want to keep them from this place called hell. Whatever it takes. The only way to avoid it is by trusting in Jesus Christ. He took your suffering in your place. He tasted hell for you and he tasted it for me and I don't have to because of what he did. But God gives you the choice. You either trust him or you reject him. Paul said, I fear lest any corrupt you from the simplicity that is in Christ. I'm done tonight. The song leader would come, piano player comes, the altar's open tonight. Wouldn't it be a good time to get that burden lifted from your heart, that fear and that, that uh, anxiety over having to pay for your own sins in this awful place called hell? Why don't you just step out by faith and say, Lord, I'm coming to you the best way I know how. I'm asking you to please have mercy on me, a sinner. What a, what a wonderful thing if you would do that tonight. As we sing, the altar is open.